Welcome to the 2023 CNA Basic Nursing Skills Practice Test. This test has 70 questions with explained answers that will help you prepare for the test. Be sure to resuscitate the like button by turning it white. Question 1. You assess your patient and he has a fever of 102.1. HR 101, RR 22. The patient appears sweaty. He most likely has what? A. An allergy to a medication. B. Upset stomach from something he ate. C. An infection. D. A migraine. The correct answer is... C. An infection. The patient most likely has an infection. This patient's temperature is high. He has tachycardia and tachypnea. The fever is the number one sign for infection. The tachycardia and tachypnea is the body trying to compensate for the fever. Question 2. You have an infant that you are caring for on your unit. What is the most accurate way to retrieve a temperature on this patient? A. Orally. B. Rectally. C. Temporally. D. Axillary. The correct answer is B. Rectally. It is always best to take an infant's temperature rectally. This ensures that the temperature is accurate, as taking the temperature rectally is from inside the body. Question 3. Which is the best way to take an apical pulse? A. To the right of the sternum underneath the clavicle. B. On the back of the fifth intercostal space. C. To the right of the sternum at the fifth intercostal space at the mid-clavicular line. D. To the left of the sternum at the fifth intercostal space at the mid-clavicular line. The correct answer is... D. To the left of the sternum at the fifth intercostal space at the mid-clavicular line. The heart is located on the left side of the chest, so the best place to listen for the apical pulse is left of the sternum. The apical pulse should be between 60 to 100 beats per minute in an adult patient. Question 4. You are performing CPR on an adult patient. At what rate should you use to properly provide CPR? A. 100 to 120 compressions per minute. B. 60 to 100 compressions per minute. C. 80 to 120 compressions per minute. D. 120 to 160 compressions per minute. The correct answer is... A. 100 to 120 compressions per minute. The proper compression rate is 100 to 120 compressions per minute, according to the American Heart Association. The proper rate is necessary to perfuse the brain and other tissue during cardiac arrest. Question 5. You are performing CPR on an adult patient. What is the correct depth per compression you should use? A. 1 inch. B. 2 inches. C. 1.5 to 2.5 inches. D. 2.5 to 5 inches. The correct answer is... B. 2 inches. In order to perfuse the brain and other important tissues during cardiac resuscitation, the rescuer should compress at a depth of at least 2 inches. The rescuer should avoid compressing at a depth of more than 2.4 inches, 6 centimeters, so that adequate perfusion is met. Question 6. You are performing CPR with a second rescuer available to you. You are performing chest compressions. The second rescuer is giving oxygen via bag and mask. At what rate should the second rescuer provide breath to the patient who is in cardiac arrest? A. One breath every two to five seconds. B. One breath every five to six seconds. C. Two breaths every ten seconds. D. One breath every six seconds. The correct answer is... D. One breath every six seconds. When you have a second rescuer available, it is important that they oxygenate the patient in cardiac arrest. One breath should be given to the patient every six seconds at a rate of 10 breaths per minute. The second rescuer performing bag and mask ventilation should tilt the head back to open the airway and place their hand in the shape of a C to properly fit the mask to the patient's face for a tight seal. Question 7. Contact precautions include what? A. Mask, gown, gloves. B. Gloves, gown. C. Mask, gown, gloves, face shield. D. Mask, gown, gloves, face shield, shoe covers. The correct answer is... B. Gloves, gown. 
Only gloves and a gown is mandatory for contact precautions. Contact means to touch. Coming into contact with a wound that is not wet is a good example. However, if the wound is wet, the CNA may want to consider adding a face shield to avoid getting any bodily fluids in the eyes. Question 8. A patient is experiencing dark stools. Which of the following conditions is the patient likely experiencing? A. GI bleed. B. Appendicitis. C. Gastroenteritis. D. Hepatitis. The correct answer is... A. GI bleed. Dark, tarry stools often indicate bleeding in the GI tract. Dark stools should be reported immediately to the nurse in charge. Question 9. You are turning a patient during your rounds. What is the best way to ensure you do not pull the Foley catheter out? A. Ensure that the catheter is secured to the inner thigh. B. Hang the Foley bag on the bed frame. C. Tell the patient to hold the bag while you roll them. D. Tape the Foley catheter to the outer thigh. The correct answer is... A. Ensure that the catheter is secured to the inner thigh. The Foley catheter should always be secured to the upper inner thigh unless there is a contraindication for it. The Foley catheter bag should never be hung on the bed frame due to the bed's ability to lift up and down and the possibility of pulling the catheter too tight. Question 10. What is the proper measurement for measuring bodily fluids? A. Ounces. B. Liters. C. Milliliters. D. Fluid ounces. The correct answer is C. Milliliters. The standard for measuring all bodily fluids in nursing is using milliliters. If a patient is drinking fluids in ounces and you need to chart input, convert ounces to milliliters by multiplying ounces times 30.1 ounce equals 30 milliliters. Question 11. You have been busy during your 12-hour shift and haven't been able to empty your patient's Foley bag. You go in right before your shift is over to document output. What output amount would bring caution? A. 1,000 milliliters. B. 600 milliliters. C. 2,100 milliliters. D. 350 milliliters. The correct answer is D. 350 milliliters. You would be concerned about 350 milliliters in the Foley catheter bag because the patient could be leaning toward acute kidney failure. A patient should have a minimum of 30 milliliters per hour of urine output. The charge nurse should be notified immediately of this patient's urine output. Question 12. You have a patient on strict dysphagia precautions. The cafeteria sent her up a lunch tray. What item would you question if it arrived on the patient's tray? A. Regular orange juice. B. Mashed potatoes. C. Jello. D. Applesauce. The correct answer is A. Regular orange juice. Typically, when a patient is on strict dysphagia precautions, they will require thickened liquids. The orange juice should be thickened with a thickener in order for the patient to consume it. The CNA or nurse should look at the MD orders to determine which consistency the orange juice is to be thickened to, i.e. honey or nectar. Question 13. You have a patient who is sweating, has a low heart rate, fruity smelling breath, and can barely speak to you. What is the next step you would take? A. Obtain a POC glucose. B. Bring the patient 24 ounces of orange juice. C. Turn the air on in the patient's room. D. Ask the patient to brush their teeth. The correct answer is... A. Obtain a POC glucose. Sweating, low heart rate, fruity breath, and confit ice changes can indicate glucose changes. The first step is to obtain a POC glucose so that you can report the glucose reading to the nurse in charge. Question 14. Which of these are important for the care of a diabetic patient? A. Giving the patient a heating pad for his feet when they're cold. B. Soaking his dry, calloused feet in a warm tub daily. C. Keep his feet dry and warm with dry, clean socks. D. Ensuring his toenails are always clipped short for cleanliness. The correct answer is... C. Keep his feet dry and warm with dry, clean socks. It is important to always keep a diabetic's feet clean and dry. Any extra soaking of the skin that may allow bacteria into broken skin can lead to infection. It is common for a diabetic patient to have neuropathy in their feet, causing them to not be able to fill their feet. 
a daily foot inspection of the feet is very important for the diabetic patient. It is imperative to allow a podiatrist to clip the toenails of a diabetic patient to decrease the risk of cuts and infection. Question 15. The patient that is bed-bound is at risk for which of the following? A. Dysphagia B. Polydipsia C. Atrophy D. Impaction The correct answer is C. Atrophy Muscle atrophy is very real for patients who are bed-bound. Atrophy is muscle wasting and it happens rather quickly. Passive and active range of motion should be done with the patient to keep the patient from experiencing atrophy. Question 16. Which of the following happens when a patient has a stroke? A. The patient urinates themselves. B. The patient may foam at the mouth. C. The patient may roll their eyes back. D. The patient may have drooping of one side of the face. The correct answer is... D. The patient may have drooping of one side of the face. It is common for the patient to have drooping of one side of the face while having a stroke. This is often called asymmetrical drooping. With asymmetrical drooping, if you ask the patient to smile and they smile, one side of the lips will not move. It is also common for one-sided eye drooping to occur. Question 17. Which of the following is the best way to prevent the spreading of germs? A. Wearing gloves during patient care. B. Wearing a mask and gloves with patient care. C. Hand washing before and after patient care. D. Wearing a gown, mask, and gloves while performing patient care. The correct answer is C. Hand washing before and after patient care. Hand washing is the number one way to keep from spreading germs in the healthcare setting. One should rub their hands together with soap for a minimum of 20 seconds during hand washing. Hand hygiene should always be performed before and after patient care. Question 18. The patient is lying in the supine position. In what position is the patient's bed? A. 90 degrees. B. Flat. C. Tilted upside down at 30 degrees. D. 45 degrees. The correct answer is B. Flat. The patient assumes the supine position when the bed is lying flat. This position may be assumed for turning and providing personal care to the patient. Question 19. Which of the following is an example of subjective information? A. The patient's pain level is 7 out of 10. B. The patient's temperature is 101.2. C. The patient had eggs for breakfast. D. The patient's blood pressure is 120 over 80. The correct answer is... A. The patient's pain level is 7 out of 10. The patient's pain level is 7 out of 10 is subjective data. Subjective means something one cannot see. The patient can tell you that they are in pain, but the pain cannot be seen. Therefore, pain is subjective. Question 20. You are using a pulse oximeter on a patient. You know a pulse oximeter is used to measure what? A. The amount of O2 in the patient's blood. B. The amount of CO2 in the patient's blood. C. The amount of CO2 in the patient's lungs. D. The amount of O2 in the patient's heart. The correct answer is A. The amount of O2 in the patient's blood. Pulse oximetry is a non-invasive way of measuring peripheral oxygen in the patient's blood. This reading is less accurate than an arterial oxygen reading. However, the pulse oximetry reading is very close to the arterial reading. Question 21. You have a patient that has incontinence who wears briefs. What is necessary for patients with stress incontinence? A. A Foley catheter to keep the skin dry. B. Frequent toileting breaks throughout the day. C. Less fluids to keep them from urinating often. D. Diuretics to help keep their bladder empty. The correct answer is... B. Frequent toileting breaks throughout the day. It is important to assist patients with incontinence to the restroom throughout the day so that their bladder isn't getting too full. A Foley catheter significantly increases the risk of a UTI. It is unsafe to withhold fluids from a patient due to incontinence. Diuretics can lead to dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. Question 22. You have a 70-year-old patient that is usually pleasant and easygoing. Today, she has cognitive delays, is hitting and kicking, and does not know who the staff are. Which condition is the patient likely experiencing? A. Urinary tract infection. B. Headache. C. Sinus infection. D. Hunger. The correct answer is 
A. Urinary tract infection. It is common for patients 65 years of age and older adults to have a UTI. A UTI in the older adult population can cause significant acute cognitive impairments. The CNA should report this to the nurse in charge. Question 23. Which one of the following would require contact precautions? A. TB. B. COVID-19. C. Pneumonia. D. MRSA. The correct answer is D. MRSA. MRSA would require contract precautions only. TB would require airborne precautions. COVID-19 would require contact, airborne, and droplet precautions. Pneumonia would require droplet precautions. Question 24. You have a patient in restraints. You know the proper place to always tie restraints to is where? A. The bed frame. B. The upper bed rail. C. The lower bed rail. D. The head of the bed. The correct answer is... A. The bed frame. The safest place to tie restraints is to the bed rail. All other parts of the bed are movable and can cause the restraints to become too loose or too tight. This can cause harm to the patient or health care employee. Question 25. How many fingers should you be able to slide under wrist restraints? A. 1. B. 0. C. 2. D. 4. The correct answer is C. 2. It is important that you can fit two fingers under the wrist restraint. This ensures that the wrist restraints are not too tight or too loose. The restraint should be assessed a minimum of every two hours. The residence should be discontinued as soon as possible. Question 26. You have a patient with generalized weakness to transfer from the bed to the chair. Which transfer device would you use? A. A Hoyer lift. B. A sit-to-stand lift. C. A sliding board. D. A gate belt. The correct answer is D, a gate belt. A gate belt is used to transfer a patient from one place to another, such as a bed to chair, chair to bed, or bed to wheelchair. It is used to assist patients who are weak, not bed-bound, in transferring. Question 27. You have a patient that has pneumonia and is weak. What teaching would you provide to the patient? A, make sure to cough and deep breathe often throughout the day. B, be sure to keep your liquid intake to 600 cc per day. C. Be sure to exercise your arms by doing range of motion multiple times a day. D. Be sure to try to be still so that your chest is not in pain. The correct answer is A. Make sure to cough and deep breathe often throughout the day. It is important for patients with pneumonia to cough and breathe deeply often to keep the pneumonia from worsening. It is important to encourage fluids to help thin any fluid in the lungs. It is also important to encourage the patient to get up and walk and move as much as possible to keep the fluid in the lungs moving. Question 28. You are putting linens on a patient's bed. You know that not having wrinkles in the sheets is important because A. It can cause a decubitus ulcer. B. The patient may get upset. C. The patient's foot may get caught in it. D. It may cause a fall. The correct answer is A. It can cause a decubitus ulcer. A decubitus ulcer is otherwise known as a bed sore. Any wrinkles in the sheets can cause breakdown in the skin, resulting in a decubitus ulcer. Patients who are in the bed for a prolonged period of time are at high risk for decubitus ulcers. Question 29. You see your diabetic patient is sweating, disoriented, and unable to speak. What is the first thing you would assess? A. Temperature. B. Pupils. C. Pulse. D. Glucose. The correct answer is... D. Glucose. When a diabetic patient is sweating, unresponsive, or disoriented, it is important to perform a point-of-care glucose. These are signs of hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia causes cognitive issues and should be treated promptly to avoid a diabetic coma. Question 30. You have a patient who is incontinent of bowel and bladder. You know this patient is at increased risk for what? A. Pressure wounds. B. Dehydration. C. Depression. D. Anxiety. The correct answer is A. Pressure wounds. Urine and feces are acidic and can break down healthy skin. Further, urine causes the skin to be wet for a prolonged period of time, causing a major risk in skin breakdown. If the skin is wet, friction from the patient's clothes or bed linens can easily cause a break in the skin. This also sets the patient up for infection if there is a break in the skin. 
Question 31. Your patient is on strict I.O. status. What is important to measure for this patient? A. All solid and liquid food that the patient consumes. B. Don't allow the patient food or water. C. Measure the patient's void first thing in the morning and last thing at night. D. Measure all liquids that the patient consumes and measure all urine output. The correct answer is D. Measure all liquids that the patient consumes and measure all urine output. I.O. means to measure all liquid intake and output. Liquids should be measured in cc or milliliters only. If a patient is drinking 4 ounce cups of water, multiply 4 ounces of water times 30 and you have 120 cc or 120 milliliters of water. 1 ounce equals 30 milliliters. A urine hat or some type of urometer should be used to measure urine output properly. Question 32. Which one of the following medical abbreviations is inappropriate for use? A. TID for three times a day. B. BID for two times a day. C. QD for daily. D. NPO for nothing by mouth. The correct answer is C. QD for daily. QD or QID should never be used for abbreviations in the medical field. It can easily be confused with QOD or other abbreviations. JCAHO states that it is only acceptable to write out daily and every other day. No abbreviations can be used for these terms. Question 33. You have a new 65-year-old diabetic patient on your unit. What is the most important thing to do before leaving the room? A. Ensure that the patient is aware of how to use the call light system. B. Ask if the patient is hungry. C. Make sure the patient knows where the restroom is. D. Ensure that the patient knows your name. The correct answer is... A. Ensure that the patient is aware of how to use the call light system. Think patient safety. The call light should always be within reach of the patient, and the patient should be educated on how to use it. While the other options are important, ensuring the patient's safety should take priority. Question 34. Your patient has an indwelling Foley catheter. Where is the best place to position the drainage bag? A. Above the bladder. B. Out or below the bladder. C. Behind the patient's head. D. At the foot of the bed. The correct answer is B. At or below the bladder. The Foley drainage bag should always be positioned at or below the level of the bladder so that the urine does not flow back toward the bladder. Remember, the Foley drainage system uses gravity. Backflow of urine to the bladder can cause a bladder infection. Question 35. The patient tells you his pain is 10 out of 10. However, the patient is smiling and talking to his visitors. You report the pain to the charge nurse because you know that A. The patient may get upset if you don't. B. The patient has a history of drug problem and needs pain meds. C. Pain is whatever the patient says it is. D. The patient isn't in pain, but he wants medication, so you should get it for him. The correct answer is... C. Pain is whatever the patient says it is. Pain is subjective. This means that there is no way to measure pain. Pain is always whatever the patient says that it is. Different patients have different pain thresholds. While one patient may be crying and grimacing in pain, another patient may be able to talk through it. Question 36. Which of the following is not an example of an ADL? A. Brushing teeth. B. Eating breakfast. C. Shopping for groceries. D. Getting dressed. The correct answer is... C. Shopping for groceries. ADLs are activities of daily living. ADLs are personal tasks that one should be able to complete. There is an acronym to remember the six ADLs. Death. Dress. Eat ambulate, transfer or toilet, and hygiene. Question 37. Which of the following are normal signs of aging? A. Incontinence. B. Losing balance. C. Memory loss. D. Slower response time. The correct answer is... D. Slower response time. While all of the above are seen in older adults, they are not all normal parts of aging. However, a slower response time is normal in the aging adult. This is because nerve cells in the nervous system die with age and they are not regenerated. Question 38. 
A fracture-type bedpan is used for patients with what condition? A. Hip fracture. B. Back injury. C. Head injury. D. Pelvic fracture. The correct answer is B. Back injury. A fracture-type bedpan is used for a patient with a back injury. Patients with back injuries usually cannot lift their hips or must maintain proper alignment while healing. The fracture-type bedpan is made to make it easier to slide underneath the patient with a back injury. Question 39. What is the medical abbreviation for before meals and at bedtime? A. ACHS B. BID C. BM D. BMAB The correct answer is A. ACHS the medical abbreviation for before meals and at bedtime is ACHS. This would be used in the case of a diabetic patient needing POC glucose checks. The patient may have orders for check glucoses before each meal and at bedtime. This would be written, glucose checks ACHS. Question 40. Which type of precautions would be used for a patient with C. diff? A. Enteric. B. Respiratory. C. Droplet. D. Standard. The correct answer is A. Enteric. Enteric precautions should be used for patients who are experiencing diarrhea due to C. diff. This includes hand hygiene, gown, and gloves before entering the patient's room. No linen should be taken outside of the patient's room without being bagged first. It is strongly suggested for patients on enteric precautions not to have visitors as this increases the risk of spreading C. diff. Question 41. When should a patient's weight be taken to obtain an accurate reading? A. At the same time every day. B. Six hours after a meal. C. With two different scales. D. At bedtime. The correct answer is A. At the same time every day. No matter what part of the day the weight is taken, it is important to weigh the patient at the same time every day. It is not necessary to use two scales, however, Using the same scale consistently is important. Question 42. You are taking care of a patient with MRSA. You need to dispose of your gown and gloves. Where is the proper place to dispose of your gown and gloves? A. In the dirty utility room. B. In the trash can outside of the patient's room. C. In the patient's room. D. There is no need to discard the gown and gloves if you're treating multiple patients with MRSA. The correct answer is... C. In the patient's room. It is important that you discard your gown and gloves in the patient's room. You would do so by the door on your way out of the door. This helps cut down on cross-contamination in the healthcare setting. Question 43. You are going to help a patient transfer from the wheelchair to the bed. Where would you stand while transferring the patient? A. Behind the wheelchair. B. In front of the wheelchair. C. To the left of the wheelchair. D. On the other side of the bed. The correct answer is B. In front of the wheelchair. When transferring a patient, the health care provider should keep their own safety in mind. The best place to stand would be in front of the wheelchair so that you could easily pivot with the patient while keeping your back safe. Question 44. You have a patient on oxygen that wants to use his new electric shaver to shave his face. You know that a. Using an electric shaver is the safest way to shave a patient with oxygen. B. A patient using oxygen should only use a standard razor due to the risk of fire. C. Using a standard razor for this patient is unsafe due to the risk of cutting the patient. D. It is unsafe for the patient on oxygen to use either an electric or standard razor. The correct answer is... B. A patient using oxygen should only use a standard razor due to the risk of fire. There is a risk for fire while using an electric razor with oxygen. The safest way to shave a patient who is on oxygen is with a standard razor. Safety razors are provided in some facilities. Question 45. A patient has edema in their lower extremities. When repositioning the patient, which position would you put the patient in to aid in decreasing edema? A. Semi-fowlers with legs above the level of the heart. B. High-fowlers with the legs below the level of the heart. C. Sims position with the legs below the level of the heart. 
D. Trendelenburg with the feet above the level of the heart. The correct answer is A. Semi-Fowlers with legs above the level of the heart. Semi-Fowlers position is assumed when the patient is in a setting position with the HOB at 45 degrees. Putting the legs above the level of the heart helps aid the fluid in the patient's lower extremities to circulate back to the heart. Question 46. You have a patient that has fallen on the floor. What is the first thing you should do? A. Assess the patient for injuries. B. Leave the patient and go tell the charge nurse. C. Help the patient up to a chair as soon as possible. D. Make the patient roll onto their left side. The correct answer is... A. Assess the patient for injuries. When a patient falls, the first thing to do is to assess the patient for injuries. The patient should not be left alone. Picking the patient up to put them in a chair would put yourself and the patient at risk for injury. The patient should be asked to lie still while you assess for injuries. Question 47. Your patient is on a fluid restriction and asks for water. You bring the patient an 8-ounce cup of water. How would you document the water in the chart? A. 160 milliliters. B. 80 cc. C. 240 milliliters. D. 8 ounces. The correct answer is... C. 240 milliliters. The correct way to document 8 ounces of water is 240 milliliters. To get this number, you would multiply 8 times 30 to get 240 milliliters. 1 ounce equals 30 milliliters. Question 48. You are providing perineal care to a patient. What is the proper way to clean the patient to avoid contamination or UTI? A. Wash from the rectum to the meatus. B. Wash with CHG products only. C. Wash from the meatus out. D. Wash with alcohol-based products only. The correct answer is... C. Wash from the meatus out. The proper way to provide perineal care to a patient is to wash from the meatus out. One should think dirty to clean. No CHG or alcohol-based products should be used as they dry out the skin. Question 49. You are counting respirations on a patient. What is the proper way to count respirations for a patient? A. Look at the chest rise for 10 seconds and multiply by 6. B. Look at the patient's chest rise and a watch... <clears throat> B. Look at the patient's chest rise and a watch simultaneously for 60 seconds. C. Use a stethoscope and count to 60. D. Look at the chest rise for 30 seconds and multiply by 2. The correct answer is... B. Look at the patient's chest rise and a watch simultaneously for 60 seconds. It is important to watch the chest rise for a full 60 seconds while counting respirations. The patient may not breathe the same amount of times in the first 30 seconds as they do in the later 30 seconds of a minute. A stethoscope is not necessary while assessing for respiratory rate only. Question 50. All of the following should be ensured while assessing a patient's blood pressure except A. The patient's leg should be crossed. B. The patient should be sitting in an upright position or lying with feet at or below the level of the heart. C. The patient should not speak during the BP check. D. The cuff should fit approximately 40% around the patient's arm. The correct answer is... A. The patient's leg should be crossed. The patient should never have their legs crossed during a BP reading. This can cause the reading to be wrong. While taking the BP, the leg should always be at or below the level of the heart. The BP cuff should not be too tight or too loose, as these can cause the BP readings to be wrong. It is important that the patient is quiet and not moving during the BP check. Question 51. A patient tells you that she has had a left-sided mastectomy two years ago. Where would you take her blood pressure? A. On the right arm only. B. On the left arm only. C. Only on the lower extremities. D. The patient is not allowed to have her BP taken due to risk for a blood clot. The correct answer is... A. On the right arm only. A patient who has had a mastectomy should never have their BP taken on the affected side. The risk for cellulitis and lymphedema is highly increased when a patient has their blood pressure taken on the affected side. Blood draws or any type of stick should also be avoided on the affected side. Question 52. 
A patient is experiencing a seizure. What is the proper thing to do? A. Place a tongue depressor in the patient's mouth to keep them from biting their tongue. B. Lay them on their left side. C. Set them upright. D. Slightly tug on the patient's tongue so that they don't swallow their tongue. The correct answer is... B. Lay them on their left side. Nothing should ever be placed in the mouth of a patient having a seizure. This can cause injury to the patient's mouth, jaw, or teeth. A patient cannot swallow their tongue. The patient should be placed on their left side to prevent aspiration. Question 53. What is the best way to palpate a carotid pulse? A. Place two fingers lightly at the front of the neck. B. Place two fingers lightly on the wrist. C. Place two fingers lightly on the side of the neck, just underneath the mandible and over the trachea. D. Place two fingers lightly behind the knee. The correct answer is... C. Place two fingers lightly on the side of the neck, just underneath the mandible and over the trachea. <laughs> to palpate a carotid pulse, you should place two fingers lightly on the side of the neck, just underneath the mandible and over the trachea. This is where the carotid artery is located. Pressing too hard can impede blood from flowing, making it hard to palpate the carotid pulse. Question 54. You walk into a patient's room and the patient is unresponsive. What is your first step? A. Call for help. B. Check for a pulse. C. Perform hand hygiene. D. Start CPR. The correct answer is... B. Check for a pulse. All of these answers are important. However, the most important is assessing whether the patient has a pulse or not. You can simultaneously call for help while assessing for a pulse. In the event of an emergency, hand hygiene may be bypassed. Further, before beginning CPR, you must check for a pulse. Question 55. There is a fire on your unit. What is the first thing you should do? A. Rescue your patients. B. Get the fire extinguisher. C. Call for help. D. Evacuate the unit. The correct answer is... A. Rescue your patients. The acronym RACE should be used during a fire. R. Rescue. A. Alarm for help. C. Confine. E. Extinguish and evacuate. The patient should never be left alone during a fire. The first step is to rescue the patient. Question 56. You are working a 12-hour shift. How often should you reposition your patients? A. Q3HR. B. Q4HR. C. Q2HR. D. Q1HR. The correct answer is C. Q2HR. The minimum a patient should be turned and repositioned is every two hours. This prevents skin breakdown and pressure ulcers. Rounding on patients at a minimum of Q2 hours can also ensure that the patient's needs are met. Question 57. You are coming on shift to meet your patient. What is the best way to ensure patient safety while meeting the patient? A. Having the patient tell you their name. B. Checking the patient's chart. C. Checking that the patient's name and room number are on the patient's door. D. Have the patient tell you his name and DOB while you make sure it matches what is on his armband. The correct answer is... D. Have the patient tell you his name and DOB while you make sure it matches what is on his armband. The best way to ensure patient safety is to have the patient tell you their name and DOB while you ensure that what they are saying is what is on their armband. The patient's name should never be placed on their door. This is a HIPAA violation. Checking the patient's chart is inadequate because you could have grabbed the wrong chart. Some patients may become confused or disoriented, so only having the patient tell you their name is not enough. Question 58. You have a patient who states that her left calf hurts. You assess it and it is red and warm to the touch. Which condition are you concerned that your patient may be suffering from? A. Stroke. B. Blood clot. C. Sprain. D. Cellulitis. The correct answer is B. Blood clot. Signs and symptoms of a blood clot include pain, redness, and warmth at the site of the blood clot. This should be reported to the charge nurse immediately as the blood clot may move and travel to the lungs or heart. Question 59. You are transferring a patient that is weak. The patient begins to fall. What is the best thing for you to do? A. Reach out and grab the patient so that they do not fall. B. 
grabbed the transfer belt and helped lower the patient gently to the floor. C. Allow the patient to fall but call for help. D. Hold on to the transfer belt and lean forward. The correct answer is... B. Grab the transfer belt and help lower the patient gently to the floor. The goal is to keep the patient safe, but to also keep yourself safe and prevent back injuries to yourself. The best way to do this is to grab the transfer belt firmly and allow the patient to gently slide to the floor. Trying to catch the patient before they fall is not good practice as it can cause injury to you or more harm to the patient. Placing one of your legs behind the patient's leg while firmly standing on your other leg while holding onto the transfer belt is best practice. Question 60. A patient has fallen and broken his foot. The foot is now in a cast. What is important to assess during your shift? A. Color and temperature of the toes. B. Color and temperature of the knee above the cast. C. Pulse behind the knee. D. Pulse in the groin. The correct answer is... A. Color and temperature of the toes. Assessing the color and temperature of the toes can help determine if the cast is too tight. The toes should be warm and pink. Any change in color or temperature should be reported to the charge nurse. Question 61. You are feeding a patient who has orders from speech therapy to perform a chin tuck while drinking liquids. What is the reason for this? A. To help the patient breathe better. B. Prevent the patient from choking. C. To prevent the patient from having to drink thickened liquids. D. To help food go down. The correct answer is... B. To prevent the patient from choking. It is common practice for speech therapy to place patients on aspiration precautions. One thing that speech therapy may ask a patient to do while eating or drinking is to perform a chin tuck. This aids in ensuring food or drink goes into the esophagus rather than the trachea while swallowing. Question 62. You have a patient with a reddened area on her coccyx. What is best practice to keep the area from becoming a stage 2 pressure ulcer? A. Washing it with soap and water. B. Turning the patient Q2HR and offloading pressure to the reddened area. C. Washing the area with alcohol to prevent germs. D. Be sure to check the area once every day to make sure it hasn't gotten worse. The correct answer is... B. Turning the patient Q to H hour and offloading pressure to the reddened area. It is important to turn bed-bound patients every two hours to ensure that they are not having skin breakdown. The area should be checked every two hours as well. Washing the area is okay, but this will not help prevent skin breakdown. Washing ready, reddened skin can cause a break in the skin as well. This can cause infection. Question 63. You are changing the linens of a patient's bed. Where should the linen be placed while you are performing the bed change? A. On the floor beside the bed. B. In the laundry bag. C. In the floor of the bathroom. D. In a red hazardous bag. The correct answer is... B. In the laundry bag. To prevent cross-contamination, the dirty bed linen should be placed in the laundry bag immediately. Placing the dirty linen on the floor can cause cross-contamination between patients. Unless soiled with blood, the linens do not have to go into a red, hazardous waste bag. Question 64. Your patient with a Foley catheter bag is wanting to ambulate in the hall to get out of his room. Which of the following is appropriate? A. Disconnect the tubing from the bag. B. Place a trash bag over the Foley bag for privacy. C. Ensure to carry the Foley bag beneath the level of the bladder. D. Hook the Foley bag on the waist or the patient's pants. The correct answer is C. Ensure to carry the Foley bag beneath the level of the bladder. The Foley catheter drainage system should always remain sterile to prevent infection risk. Therefore, it should never be disconnected unless ordered by a doctor. Hooking the Foley bag on the waist of the patient's pants would cause the bag to be higher than the bladder, causing backflow of urine to the bladder. While placing something over the Foley bag for privacy is not necessarily wrong, but the most important thing to remember here is to keep the Foley bag below the level of the bladder. Question 65. You have a patient wanting to ambulate and walk around. You ask her to sit on the side of the bed for a few minutes before standing so that A. You can get her walker for her. B. You can help her get dressed. C. To prevent orthostatic hypotension. D. That she can prepare her muscles to stand.
The correct answer is C, to prevent orthostatic hypotension. It is common for a patient standing up too quickly to experience orthostatic hypotension. This means that the BP bottoms out due to the patient standing too quickly. To ensure that this does not happen, the CNA should ask the patient to sit on the side of the bed with feet dangling for a few minutes before ambulating. Question 66. You have a patient with dark amber colored urine. You know this is a sign of what? A. Impending heart attack. B. Dehydration. C. Kidney stone. D. Impending death. The correct answer is B. Dehydration. Amber-colored urine is a sign of dehydration. The patient should be encouraged to drink more fluids to ensure the kidneys are flushing out toxins as needed. The older adult should especially be encouraged to drink fluids as they may sometimes forget to drink, causing dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. Question 67. Which of the following is true about side rails? A. One side rail on each side of the bed should be raised at all times. B. All four side rails raised at a time is safest for the patient. C. Side rails only have to be raised if the patient is sleeping. D. Only bed rails on one side of the bed should be raised at a time. The correct answer is... A. One side rail on each side of the bed should be raised at all times. The top side rails on each side of the bed are to be raised at all times, whether the patient is sleeping or not. If all four side rails are raised, it is considered a restraint. It is okay for two side rails on one side of the bed to be raised. All four bed rails are usually only raised when the patient is being transported on the bed. Question 68. You have a patient that has a colostomy bag. You are changing the colostomy bag and realize the stoma is dark purple. What is your next step? A. Nothing. This is a normal variation of the color of the stoma. B. Report it immediately to the charge nurse. C. Rub the stoma with a wet washcloth. D. Leave the colostomy bag off for a couple of hours to allow oxygen to get to the stoma. The correct answer is... B. Report it immediately to the charge nurse. The stoma is the part of the colostomy that is seen outside of the abdomen. It should always be pink to red in color. A purple stoma would indicate a lack of oxygen to the stoma and could result in the patient losing more of their colon or intestines. It is okay to pay the stoma with a wet washcloth, but rubbing should be avoided. Leaving the colostomy bag off could result in feces getting everywhere. Reporting the purple stoma to the charge nurse is essential. Question 69. You have a patient that you need to chart I.O. on for breakfast. The patient had 6 ounces of coffee, 8 ounces of a protein shake, and 9 ounces of orange juice. How will you document this in the patient's chart? A. 23 ounces of liquid. B. 23 fluid ounces of liquid. C. 690 milliliters. D. 1,380 milliliters. The correct answer is... C. 690 milliliters. The correct way to document is in milliliters or cc. 6 ounces plus 8 ounces plus 9 ounces of fluid is 23 ounces. To get this number, you would multiply 23 ounces times 30 to get 690 milliliters. 1 ounce equals 30 milliliters. Question 70. You have a patient that just received short-acting insulin 5 minutes ago for their morning dose. When should the patient eat their breakfast? A. ASAP. B. The patient should wait 30 minutes to allow the insulin to take effect. C. The patient cannot eat for another hour. D. The patient should wait 15 minutes to ensure the insulin reaches their bloodstream. The correct answer is... A. ASAP. Short-acting insulin begins working within 30 to 60 minutes. It is important for the patient to eat breakfast as soon as they receive it so that they do not forget to eat or get sidetracked. Thank you for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it. Check out these videos that can help you with your future studies. Don't forget to resuscitate the like button and subscribe to our channel. And please share this video with your fellow nursing friends.